Just visit our newly opened Credit Union building on Upper Newgate Street, Monday to Fridays, 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. with proof of ID and address, along with $15 to cover registration and passbook. And you'll be set and on your way. For further information, call 462-8888 or 727-2285. People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. Today, tomorrow, together. The United Progressive Party. The right choice. It's time to join the family at the People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. We offer savings accounts, deposits, fixed deposits, loans, among other related services. You can even become a shareholder by purchasing a minimum of 50 shares at $5 per share. Membership is super easy and convenient. Just visit our newly opened Credit Union building on Upper Newgate Street, Monday to Fridays, 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. with proof of ID and address, along with $15 to cover registration and passbook. And you'll be set and on your way. For further information, call 462-8888 or 727-2285. People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. Today, tomorrow, together. The United Progressive Party. The right choice.
It's time to join the family at the People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. We offer savings accounts, deposits, fixed deposits, loans, among other related services. You can even become a shareholder by purchasing a minimum of 50 shares at $5 per share. Membership is super easy and convenient. Just visit our newly opened credit union building on Upper Newgate Street, Monday to Fridays, 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. with proof of ID and address, along with $15 to cover registration and passbook, and you'll be set and on your way. For further information, call 462-8888 or 727-2285. People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. Today, tomorrow, together. The United Progressive Party. The right choice. Good evening. Let me, take, let me take this opportunity to welcome you, the listening and viewing audience, to this UPP budget analysis panel discussion. I am thankful that you have decided to join us. I can assure you that this will have a productive exchange, and we will have a productive exchange this evening. The budget is a very serious document that outline our country's economic economy for the fiscal year and sets the stage for where we want to go as a country. It should always be presented in an honest and truthful manner and should never be misleading or deceitful. The people should at all times be able to trust the budget as they are guided by its content and it will inform their decision making. This evening's panel comprised of Brother Sheffield Boyan, Sister Pearl Quinn Williams, Dr. George Daniel, and Brother Cartwright Marshall. We will look at the budget and speak to you, the audience, as to how this budget will affect your life for, you, for the next 12 months. We will look at a number of issues and topics to include our debt position, revenue, expenditure, GDP, credibility of our government, tourism as our main economic driver and group, and management of the economy. We will also look at bread and butter issues that are facing each and every family every single day. So now that we have you locked in, let us begin. Let me introduce our panel to you. To my left, we have Brother Sherfield Bowen. To his left, Dr. George Daniel. To my right, we have Sister Pearl Quinn Williams. And to her right is Brother Cartwright Marshall. 
I will invite each of the panelists to give an open remark, starting with Brother Sheffield Bowen. Uh, thank you. Good night, one and all. Good night, especially to my friends and family, neighbors, constituents in St. Philip South. Tonight, I am going to be looking on the budget to see how it relates to the poor, especially the people that I am seeking to represent. The budget presented was titled, Setting the Stage for Economic Rejuvenation. I think it would be more appropriate if it was called setting the stage for the election, because what is presented really is an election budget. This is a budget that speaks to a number of things, but I am more concerned of what it did not speak to. It did not speak to unemployment and what the government seeks to do to assist those who have lost their jobs. There is no employment policy with respect to all those people who would have lost their job from 2020 and 2021. The only thing it says about unemployment is that they gave kudos to themselves that no public sector employee went on the breadline. Well, what about the others? This was totally left silent. What did the budget say towards the cost of COVID testing? COVID testing is something when visited upon the poor. They have to choose between paying for this COVID test and paying their rent. They have to choose between paying for the COVID test and eating. They have to choose between paying for the COVID test and all the other necessaries that they have. No relief is granted in this budget for the cost of COVID testing. What did it say about stimulus? It's nada, silent. Nothing at all is said about stimulus to the people. However, assistance can be granted, none. Now, juxtapose that to the realization that over $125 million came in from CIP funds. What did it say about assistance to the private sector? Those businesses that fail or are on the brink of failing? Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Now, this is, when you think about this, you, you must look at our neighbors and other countries that provided these economic relief. St. Kitts, Dominica, and other countries that have far less uh, economies than us. They did provide those kind of help. What the budget says about cost of living and how the government seeks to attack the increase in cost of living. Nada. In fact, when you look at the budget and to see how the increase in money supply, that is a driver to create even more inflation. So the money that you took to the shop or to the supermarket to buy a bag of goods, today that same bag of goods is going to call for more money. And with the increase in money supply, without concurrent increase in economic output and, and production, is also going to cause more price increases, more inflation. It did speak to construction as, as a driver, as a growth factor. But while it speaks to construction, what did it say about heavy duty equipment operators? If construction boom and increases, they too should be feeling that increase. But only a particular small few heavy duty operators would have received this benefit. What did it say to concrete producers? I'll tell you what it says to concrete producers. I came uh, in sight of a document where a concrete plant in the tune of $5.8 million was added to the number of concrete plants that they have in Antigua. And this is at, you know, triple the, probably the cost of the true price of the concrete plant, siphoning the monies from the treasury into 
private entities. But the existing concrete plants, nothing to assist them. So this is what I find that the budget said and what it did not say, but it did not go to reach the working class and even the middle class of Antigua and Barbuda. This is my opening remark. Thank you very much, Brother Bowen. Let me go to Dr. Daniel to get his opening remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. An essential first step in analyzing any proposition, sets of proposition or argument, is to determine the truth value of the statements made. Unfortunately, too often for this ALP administration, the Gaston Brown administration, the statements made when fact-checked are not always in sync with the truth. And as stated by the administration's prominent mouthpiece, statements are often made or designed to dazzle the citizenry. As was said, we want to dazzle them with BS. An example of this occurred early in PM Gaston's Brown budget presentation last Thursday, the 3rd of February. Numerous times, PM Brown stated there was GDP growth of 5.3% in 2021 and gave the ECCB, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, as the source for this 5.3 estimate. I've checked the ECCB and I'm unable to verify that the value to be assigned to this often repeated statement by PM Brown in his budget statement is true. In fact, based on the information presently available from the ECCB, and anyone can go to their website, eccb-centralbank.org, once we check on that, PM Brown often repeated 5.3% GDP growth in 2021 is a false statement. Actually, when you actually go to the, to the site and you look at the growth statements, you would recognize that between 2019, when there was growth of 4.86%, 2020, a decline of 20.19%, in 2021, growth was only 1.76%, and the projection for 2022 is 4.22%. Those are the numbers if you look at them in what is referred to as in constant prices. That is when you make allowance a decline of almost 20%, projected growth for 2021 is 3.7%, and 6% in 2022. Typically, though, when you're making comparisons, it is the constant prices that are used. So on that basis, as he said in his statement, 20% declined in 2020. The projection for 2021 in the ECCB statement is 1.76% and not the 53 as stated. The 5.3 GDP growth is nowhere to be found. An even more outrageous and astounding example of PM Gaston's bound attempt to dazzle with BS was his assertion that there was a 25% turnaround in GDP in 2021. 20% decline in 2020 plus a 5% growth in 2021, according to his math, gave a 25% economic turnaround. If this was a scenario for a grade three or for form three math test, he would, and he gave that answer, he would have gotten naught for that test. 
As a matter of fact, Antiguan Barbuda was taken down a 20-foot hole in 2020. Crawled up five feet in 2021. And when that statement was made by the Prime Minister, the Sinker fans applauded as if all was well. Totally oblivious to the subsequent statement that the economy is projected at the end of 2022 to be half a billion dollars below where we were in 2019. That's still more than halfway down the 2020 20% 20 hole. And I'm amazed that he actually had the 25% turnaround actually written into his statement because it sounded more like a con man's move. It's like Brother Boyan. The con man borrows $20 from you. He pays you back five and tells you that you're $25 better off. That's essentially what that statement was about. It's a total con. And it's as if he was playing the con game. Some people have a lot of gall. And PM Brown looks like he's aiming to have the most gall. Especially when he made the statement about ALP introducing CIP. The gall of that statement. The Baldwin Spencer administration swallowed the bitter pill. Paid the political price in introducing the CIP. Not one ALP member, not Gaston Brown, not one member of the ALP in the Senate voted in support of the CIP bill. And he wants to have the gall to claim that is the ALP introduced the CIP. As I said earlier, an analysis must begin with the analysis of the truth of the statements made. And for the Gaston Brown administration, truth is stranger than fiction. And I strongly condemn their cynical attempts to insult the intelligence of Antiguans and Barbudans, both at home and abroad. The fact-checking will continue, but so far as a teacher for half a century is not the Gaston Brown administration is getting. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let us have opening remarks from Brother Cartwright Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My statement is going to be very short. By looking at the budget, once again, we can see that the budget is long on promises, but very short in terms of strategic policy direction. There is no doubt that COVID-19 demands new strategic position and new leadership. And when we listen to the budget presentation by the finance minister, the prime minister of Antigua and Barbuda, it is quite clear that these values did not form part of any such decision. It clearly tells us that there is need for change in Antigua and Barbuda if we are going to overcome the hurdle of underdevelopment and foreign domination of our economy by the current Antigua Labour Party. And I must just say this in support of Brother Daniel when I look at the ECLAC report for 2021, the growth rate predicted there was 4.2%. And again, when we look at ECLAC report with respect to foreign direct investment in Antigua and Barbuda, in 2021, we were some 78% below the figure for the previous year. And so it is quite clear, very clear, that the budget that was presented or what was presented as a budget for Antigua and Barbuda lacks substance and can never deliver 
any tangible result that would result in the development of the people, for the people, and by the people. Thank you, Brother Marshall. We have opening remarks from Sister Pearl Queen Williams. Thank you, Winston. I want to support my brothers who would have spoken before me, and I want to say that I found their statement to be empty of anything of substance for the people. But it was filled with a lot of self-praise, lies, there was a lot of political rhetoric and propaganda, empty promises, and at the end of the grandstanding, what can the people say was in it for them? Can the poor people look forward to anything that could improve their standard of living? Can the business people, the public servants, look forward to um, anything that can support their businesses? Can the public servants, the government creditors, look forward to getting the monies owed to them? After this long, all this long talking over the heads of the people, over the heads of the masses, using all kind of fin financial jargon, the voodoo mat mathematics, can the masses look forward to getting some relief at the pumps? <laughs> can they look forward to getting relief with the food prices? Can they look forward to real opportunities? And I'm not talking about opportunities, these pseudo opportunities from um, these pseudo projects, regurgitated projects that they have been bringing back year after year. Uh, that we know will never get off of the ground. When I hear the kind of empty self-praise statements, it is enough to anger the people of this country. How can you be talking about astute management of scarce resources when you are using six million from a loan to purchase the Luke Cinema? That was done in February of last year to bail out a cabinet colleague. How can that be astute management of scarce resources? And we have to remember that, that that transaction went straight to the financial institution to clear the Deluxe loan. So there was no cash injection into the economy. That would have um, been the case, let's say they had paid, um, put some money to pay some of the um, severance to the LIAC workers, or let's say they had given uh, cash stimulus uh, you know, during the pandemic. So that would have had a positive impact on economic activity. But these are the things that concern me. These are the things that concern me as, uh, 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 and that concern the masses as well. And in my opinion, the budget speech failed to address these concerns, and it is lacking in empathy, and so I would give it a failing grade. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you very much to all the panelists for their opening remarks. We are going to take a break at this time, and when we come back, we have a lot to unpack, and we'll be diving into, delving into some of the issues and some of the concerns that I'm sure you, the audience, and the people of Antigua and Barbuda will have with this budget 2022. So we'll be right back. It's time to join the family at the People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. We offer savings accounts, deposits, fixed deposits, loans, among other related services. You can even become a shareholder by purchasing a minimum of 50 shares at $5 per share. Membership is super easy and convenient. Just visit our newly opened credit union building on Upper Newgate Street, Monday to Fridays, 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. with proof of ID and address, along with $15 to cover registration and passbook, and you'll be set and on your way. For further information, call 462-8888 or 727-2285. People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. Today, tomorrow, together.
the United Progressive Party. The right choice. It's time to join the family at the People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. We offer savings accounts, deposits, fixed deposits, loans, among other related services. You can even become a shareholder by purchasing a minimum of 50 shares at $5 per share. Membership is super easy and convenient. Just visit our newly opened credit union building on Upper Newgate Street, Monday to Fridays, 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. with proof of ID and address, along with $15 to cover registration and passbook, and you'll be set and on your way. For further information, call 462-8888 or 727-2285. People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. Today, tomorrow, together. The United Progressive Party. The right choice. It's time to join the family at the People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. We offer savings accounts, deposits, fixed deposits, loans, among other related services. You can even become a shareholder by purchasing a minimum of 50 shares at $5 per share. Membership is super easy and convenient. Just visit our newly opened credit union building on Upper Newgate Street, Monday to Fridays, 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. with proof of ID and address, along with $15 to cover registration and passbook, and you'll be set and on your way. For further information, call 462-8888 or 727-2285. People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. Today, tomorrow, together. government's handling of the pandemic. He would have indicated that they have done a exceptional job. So let us look at the government's handling of the pandemic. And I would like to ask each of the panelists as to give your in your own words, tell us how do you think, believe the government handled the pandemic? I'll, let me start with Dr. Daniel. The objective during the pandemic of any government was to ensure or to obtain the minimum damage to the economy. In this particular case, or when we look around the region and look around the world, what most unfortunately, we didn't see this in the plans and the programs that were put out by this particular administration. We have been 
touting, and I guess we have got in this, boat, in this budget how we touted our economic growth. But I would prefer to the management of a place like St. Kitts. Although they didn't have the same level of economic growth, we did not, they did not, they were able, let me put it this way, they were able to give their citizens a stimulus at the end of the years, and for two years during the pandemic, their citizens got double salary, double pension, and Antigua still languished, which begs the question, what makes that difference? Is it that our administration, which they started out from a much better position because we have been touting our economic growth coming up to 2019, much higher than that of Senkitz. But at the end of the day, Senkitz was able to give their citizens significant stimulus to maintain their economy so they did not have a 20% decline as occurred in Antigua. So we have to dig ourselves out of a deeper hole by not taking the prudent me measures that would have sustained the economy at greater levels. So we are still in a hole. We are still a half a billion dollars below where we were in 2019. And it's going to take a lot more effort to dig ourselves out of that deeper hole. I don't know what the wise men in the Tiga Labor Party administration thought, but their policies seem to be of neo-colonialism. Their thoughts are only for concessions to foreign investors and not really investing in the people of Antigua and Barbuda. Typically, they tout how things are good, but when it comes to putting money into the pockets of Antiguans and Barbudans, there's never any money. No money for pensions, no money for back pay, no money for late workers, no money for the suppliers of services to the government. This is the situation that we find ourselves in. We are in a deeper hole than most of our fellow OECS countries, and we're going to have to dig ourselves out of that deeper hole by failure to address the economic situations during the pandemic. Yes, let me, let me look at what the Prime Minister said about the pandemic in his statement. He said, Mr. Speaker, as a people, we can be proud that our management response to the pandemic results in far less deaths than in most countries. Is that the truth? He also said in his budget that his government is a government that puts the people first, second, third, and last. Let me give you my experience. I, I was working in Tortola during the pandemic. And I first went there in October of 2020. In Tortola, when you get off the plane, you get tested. And you don't interact with no one in Tortola at all. The Taxi driver has a party shot, he take it to the hotel. You go to your room. There was a police outside the door. You get your food, you get your towels, and you put them back outside. And for throughout the quarantine, no one interacts with you. The nurse calls me three times every day. The nurse calls me three times every day. Plus you have to monitor. Now, when I came back, I also went into quarantine. They tell me the nurse is going to call me. Never happened. Never happened. When I was driving home, I was driving on interacting. No control mechanism whatsoever. And they say that they manage COVID. Now, the dashboard is showing some 6,000 something COVID cases. That's 6% of our population. 6% percent. Is that better than most countries? I say no. This COVID pandemic has been 
irresponsibly managed and it created and caused and contributed to the spread of it. Antigua and Barbuda was one of the first countries that opened up from the center of COVID concentration, from ground zero, bringing people who are so exposed into our country. Is that management of the people or seeking to collect money? That's what I think about the bad manage of the pandemic. Sister Pearl? I want to agree with my brothers, Daniel and Sherfield, and add to that, that the mandate was a big issue. It's a big, big blotch on this, uh, the management of COVID. The discrimination against unvaccinated persons is also a big, big blot. And what they did to children and unvaccinated public servants, I think it's a big blot on the management of COVID. I believe, I believe then, as I do now, that had they continued with the education exercises, trying to persuade people to get vaccination, vaccinated on their free will would have been a better way to go. Persons are still very, very angry because they believe that they were forced to be vaccinated. There was a lack of empathy. There was a, a, a narrative that it was the vaccinated, the unvaccinated that was spreading the um, the virus and that was not the case both vaccinated and unvaccinated spread the virus and so i see the hurt in a lot of people because of the vaccine mandates that were put on them and then to top it off they failed to pay the persons who were who were sent home because they were not vaccinated and they're still not i'm still not hearing that in the budget that they're going to be paying those persons and these are some of the things that persons were looking for in the budget those persons who lost two months um, pay it's almost as if you were punishing them and that's not right that's not right as a government, you should not be punishing your people because they've chosen to exercise their freedom to choose. And so I believe that that was a big block. And, it, and, and the case of the children, I think that was unexcusable. I, I remember one child said to me that she went to school after the vaccination mandate came out. And the, the head teacher asked her if she, had, um, if she was vaccinated. And she told the head teacher, no, I was, she was not vaccinated. And she said, you have to leave the premises right away, right away. Leave the premises now. In that, just at such a cold, uncaring way. And the child said she felt so badly. It was as if she had leprosy or something. She had done something terribly wrong. And I don't think that that was right. So, and I think it was perpetuated by the constant narrative that unvaccinated were the ones spreading the disease, the, the virus. Oftentimes you would hear um, the chief of staff saying, oh, they don't want to, you don't want to catch it from the unvaccinated people. You don't want to catch it from the unvaccinated people. And now we are seeing evidence where everybody in a party, in a, 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 at a family function is vaccinated and boosted and, every, and, and, and 10, 10 persons there get get um, got got the virus so what they were doing in terms of discrimination of unvaccinated persons I, I i think that is a big 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 blot on their management of covid thank you my in my mind that covid is a health issue which have serious economic implication and the failure of the ALP administration to provide any stimulus package to assist our small and medium-sized enterprises 
was the critical result which led, led to the failure of some 900 small and medium-sized enterprises. At the same time, the failure of the ALP administration to guarantee the rights, the fundamental rights of people to choose for education, for employment opportunities, is an indication that the ALP administration lacks empathy and that the way we should go with respect to a caring society is something that is not in the vocabulary of the Antigua Labour Party. And so to my mind, they would have failed, failed, failed in all terms to ensure that they look after the welfare of the people of Antigua and Barbuda. We have, we have heard um, that the Antigua Labour Party has often make the statement, and even in the budget you heard it as well, that we did not send home anybody. And they tout that as an accomplishment. We did not send home anybody. I also listened to the Prime Minister on one of his radio programs, and the question was asked of him that the persons, the public servants who were home for two months and were not paid because they were not vaccinated and they could not come to work, are you prepared to do something in terms of some relief for them? And the answer in a very cold way came back, did they work? I, I just want to ask, because I know a number of persons who would have decided that, listen, I can't take this vaccine. And as a result of that, they were out of a job. Can we equate that, um, Brother Boy? Can we equate that the fact that persons' decision to not take the vaccine and as a result of that, the government indicating to them, if you do not take the vaccine, you cannot work. But at the same time, the government is saying that we did not send home anybody during this particular pandemic. How do you square that? I think that's just an excess of your power. Because whenever you have to deal with a citizenry and you're going to curtail their rights, you're going to need to look in the least intrusive manner that you can curtail those rights to reach the objective that you wish to reach. So in saying that you cannot work and therefore you cannot earn money if you're not vaccinated, it, it's an abuse of power, power. An alternative way could have sent home people. And remember, this COVID vaccine was, was a new phenomenon. Some people felt that it's untested and some people felt they don't want to be an experiment. Uh, and, and the government, in listening to that, that's a reasonable, reasonable proposition. So what was needed is encouragement. You know, you co and you massage, and you educate, and you get um, the health professionals to help people to make the decision, rather than just, you know, having this Hitler approach, you vaccinate or you don't eat. It's an abuse of power. I also want to ask Sister Pearl to follow up and just tell us a little bit about how this particular policy, vaccinate or you can't work or you can't earn, how has that affected persons within your community or your constituency? They're very hurt by it. They're very hurt by it. One of the things that persons have been saying to me is what even when they went back out to work a, a particular uh, staff said that they went back out to work and the vaccinated persons were upset with them because they were saying some of them who felt that they were forced to be vaccinated um felt that look now you, you, you're called back the back the unvaccinated persons and so they have been treated in a way as if they are uh, second class workers and it is not fair they are still very angry that they're not paid some of them had rent to pay some had um, commitments monthly some persons pay their school fees 
on a monthly basis. They had school fees to pay. They couldn't pay it. They had to be asking, going outside of their comfort zone to ask persons to borrow money for those two months that they were at home and not paid. And so it, it, is, um, it was very unfortunate that the government did what they did to those persons. I really believe that those persons should be paid. And we in the United Progressive Party, has, we have said that once we take governance of this country, we are going to pay those persons who are not paid during that period. It is very unfortunate that the government took that stance. It is, it is not fear, and it is cruel and heartless. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to change gears a little bit. We'll be right back. It's time to join the family at the People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. We offer savings accounts, deposits, fixed deposits, loans, among other related services. You can even become a shareholder by purchasing a minimum of 50 shares at $5 per share. Membership is super easy and convenient. Just visit our newly opened credit union building on Upper Newgate Street, Monday to Fridays, 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. with proof of ID and address, along with $15 to cover registration and passbook, and you'll be set and on your way. For further information, call 462-8888 or 727-2285. People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. Today, tomorrow, together. The United Progressive Party. The right choice. It's time to join the family at the People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. We offer savings accounts, deposits, fixed deposits, loans, among other related services. You can even become a shareholder by purchasing a minimum of 50 shares at $5 per share. Membership is super easy and convenient. Just visit our newly opened credit union building on Upper Newgate Street, Monday to Fridays, 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. with proof of ID and address, along with $15 to cover registration and passbook, and you'll be set and on your way. For further information, call 462-8888 or 727-2285. People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. Today, tomorrow, together. Welcome back. When we, when you left us, or when I left you, just for a brief moment, we were just talking about the whole issue of government pandemic management. We're going to shift gears a little bit because I, I want um, Brother Boyne to speak about government self-enrichment policy and how that has affected 
either negatively or positively towards the economy of Antigua and Barbuda. Brother Boyne? Yes. Thank you. Now, the ethos of the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party was announced by the Prime Minister. He encouraged his ministers to seek creative ways to enrich themselves. I want to refer to a contract, and let me give the background. <clears throat> the government needed aggregates, and the government sent out its engineers to find where they can get aggregates. The Barbuda project, the PLH project, needed a lot of aggregates. And hence, there is this need for more aggregates to be produced. The government found that it has lands in Bethesda that has a large deposits of aggregates that can be exploited for the needs, needs of the government, needs of other, in, uh, other um, owners who need the aggregate have been found that the government land has these aggregates underneath it. The same day this survey was done and signed by the surveyor, the same day, the 19th of July, the chief surveyor of the government authenticated it. Now, the chief surveyor is supposed to, and his staff, is supposed to go out and check the surveys and measures and make sure they are sane. I am not saying that he did not. All I'm saying is that the date of the draftsman drawing is the same date of the authentication. Right after it was authenticated, there was a contract, a lease contract, to a private person to lease the quarry. And in that contract, it provides for $250 per acre per year for the quarry lands and a royalty of three dollars per ton for the aggregates mined. Now when you consider the cost and the value of the aggregates is in the vicinity of seventy dollars per ton and when you consider that the government is the owner and could exploit all of that monies the representative for Bethesda and St. Philip South is from power. The owner of the company that got the lease is from power. And next thing, we find billboards going up, going up around St. Peter that Warden Turner is a candidate for the Antigua and Barbie of the Labour Party. And when you look at the lease, Warden Turner is the recipient of the lease. Self-enrichment policy. Now, this is millions of dollars potentially to be exploited. But if it's shifted from the government budget and balance sheet into the budget of a private family or, or cohorts, uh, colleagues, and hangers-on of the Antigua Labor Party, how then must the government find monies to pave the road and pay teachers and build schools and all the things that the government must do when they take a center of revenue and profits and put it in the hands of private persons. This affects every one of us. And it's evil and it's, you know, it's almost criminal for them to do that. So this self-enrichment policy is detrimental to all of us. And it robs us and then we end up with a budget with a 600 million deficit and that deficit now has to be financed by debts, and it, we just go deeper and deeper and deeper into an economic quagmire. That's what self-enrichment does to our people. I, I want to turn to Sister Pearl, because, and pretty much on the same question, because I've heard you on many occasions speak about the $6 million, and even in your opening remarks, you address that again. And I have, I've already sensed that this is a very serious and burning issue for you, simply because the amount of opportunities that could be derived for young people, young entrepreneurs, if the government was focused on their development 
and not self-enrichment. So how has this self-enrichment policy affected persons within your community and robbed them of opportunities, Sister Pearl? The constituents, especially the business people, are very angry because they look at the person that is supposed to be representing them, accepting, no, he may say he wasn't at the cabinet meeting, he didn't have anything to do with it, but in a time like this, when you know that your constituents are suffering, you should have said to the prime minister, even if that was the plan before the COVID, you should have said to him and your cabinet colleagues, no, I can't do it. I can't accept it in this time when my people are suffering. If you really had any modicum of integrity, that's what you should have done. Not say, not take it and, and, and take a kind of approach like, well, you know, it, it's, it's, I wasn't there or it, it's, it's a building that is being bought. What can we do with a building at this time? So many persons, and I've heard that there are other buildings, even in that vicinity around there, that went up for sale, that the, 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 the businesses were failing and the banks were coming after those businesses. How come those persons were not given an opportunity for the government to purchase their building from them and bail them out? And... You know, the, there's a gas station just close to the Deluxe Cinema that, that, that went up during the, the, the time. But I'm saying it is not right what happened. Even the persons, the Liat persons and so who live, who live in my constituency, they are concerned because they say, here you are, you, you've given us $2 million and said during the Christmas and say, hey, take this compassionate payment. This is a part of the compassionate payment. What if you had that $6 million that you could have added to the $2 million that you gave them? It would have gone so much further. So many more persons would have been able to get. Hotel workers who were not working, they could have gotten a $500. Somebody could, uh, even if it was a one-off payment. Come on. At, the, at a time like this, and I don't know who would have the heart to go to these people and ask for their vote at a time like this. No, you want, I mean, really? So I, uh, those people in the constituency, those business persons, they have said, look, they didn't even, they didn't see him around. They never, he never said, look, how can we support you? What, what, what help? Give us some suggestions as to what we can do to support you. None of that. It was all about himself bailing him out so this whole self-enrichment thing when it happens the people suffer the masses suffer the poor people suffer so you must pay attention to it my people you cannot say look oh what well they didn't do anything illegal because that's a big thing for them they're always saying oh so what illegal he don't do nothing illegal what's legal is not always right Thank you very much. Um, could you just pass the microphone to Brother Marshall? Because I also want for him to come in, because I'm quite sure, um, Sister Pearl, that your constituency um, is not the only um, victim to the self-enrichment policy of the government. So, Brother Marshall, could you comment on that a little bit for me, please? Yes. A number of things I would like to say. First of all, the assets of this country belongs to the people. And secondly that the parliamentary representative and ministers of government are only trustees for the assets of the people. And so when they use, whether it is financial assets or land, like for example, Sam Cohen in Barbuda, when they utilize the assets for their own self-enrichment, what it means, it means that the people in the various communities, and for example, the constituency of St. Mary South, are deprived of the opportunity for meaningful investment in the constituency and in the country to ensure meaningful employment, decent health care, safety and security in the communities, and that the young people are provided with opportunities so that they can live self 
fulfilling lives. And so, if you remember that in the American Declaration of Independence, it is said that government are instituted to provide safety and the well-being of the people. And so, corruption eats away the opportunities for the well-being of the people, for the employment opportunities, for them to lead decent standard of living. And I am saying that the time has come when the people of St. Mary's South and the people of Antigua and Barbuda must say enough is enough. We elect them to look after our welfare, and when they fail to do so, we have to take the necessary step. Because the power of the people is greater than the power of those who hold political office in Antigua and Barbuda. So, yes, moderator, you're extremely right. Two weeks ago, we were in Crabsville, and there were some people who are employed via contract by the government to clean the road. And they clearly said, for the last two to three years, they have not received a single cent from the government. And they have to buy the weed walker. They also have to buy the gas and everything. But they have to go out there day in, day out, to ensure that the community is clean, that people can enjoy the aesthetic of the community, but at the same time, they are deprived of the revenue or the income or the salary which they justly deserve simply because of corruption and a government that is bent on self-enrichment. They have to go. Thank you very much, Brother Marshall. I want to switch to Dr. Daniel because I want for him to just give us a comparison between the 2021 um, budget promises. Um, could you just speak a little bit about that, Dr. Daniel? Perhaps I'll go a, a little further because some of these promises have been in existence since 2014, 2015, and they've failed. Perhaps I'll just go just before the pandemic so you have no excuse. What happened to the Marriott courtyard at the airport? That was just before the pandemic. So it was a clear year. Everything was in, in order, according to the budget presentation. Marriott courtyard. Well, we've heard the Kaluke that goes all the way back to 2015. Um, the Morris Bay, um, the Sheikh, all the way back to 2015. We have heard it year after year. What has happened to that? Well, we, we come back. The government, the government is taking that over, we said. We're going to do it on our own. The Sheikh is not there. Uh, what about Half Moon Bay? Um, Replay was the name of the company. What has happened to that? Uh, I, we had heard of a Best Western. What has happened to the Best Western? Uh, well, Valley Church. Valley Church was one of those spin-offs from our Chinese investor into the West Indies Oil Company. What has happened to that? Uh, we have year after year the same regurgitation of the same old project. Yida, 200 million a year for 10 years, $2 billion over 10 years. The 10 years is fast approaching. Eight years gone, and we haven't gotten the first 200 million. Why? And that has been regurgitated every year. Well, the Prime Minister at one stage told us that, um, well, they had problems getting money out of China, and he was helping them. Then at another stage, he told us that they sold the airport in Germany for 200 million. And the scams just keep going on and on and on. Again, as I said earlier, when they make a statement, can we believe it? 
the first question we have to ask when a statement is made is, is it true? Because we have gone through all of these projects and they're still to get off the ground in 2022. Um, Yida? Uh, in addition to Yida, there have been many others, uh, the Barbuda projects. Our good friend, Mr. De Niro, after all these years, eight years, all we get is, is a restaurant? Come on, Mr. Prime Minister. You got to do better than that. So we've gotten all these promises year after year after year. We're told that there's going to be $2 billion of investment coming into the economy. Where is it? As a matter of fact, nobody believed them. Because if you have a $4 billion economy and you're getting $2 billion additional in a year, you're looking at 50% growth even before you look at the multiplier effects. So all these grand promises, and we have them repeated in the 2022 budget. What did the former prime minister, when they were doing all their ground faking, warn them about? Come on, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Gaston Brown, stop faking it. The thing is that nobody is willing to do business with our prime minister. And the sooner we realize it, the better. Those investors who have come, where are they now? He told us that Mr. Verde, the billionaires, and billionaires know billionaires. So he was the one who claimed that he brought Mr. Verde here. And billionaires know billionaires, so they'll bring more billionaires. Now that Mr. Verde gets into trouble, he throw him under the bus and want to blame it on his colleague from St. Peter as the one who brought him here. No, Mr. Prime Minister, please, we need to get you out of the way so that we can have reputable people willing to come and invest in Antigua because nobody, nobody wants to do business with this Prime Minister. Our regional prime ministers, which one of them would want to deal with him? Definitely not Mr. Ralph Gonzalez, which was the prime minister who was closest to Antigua. Can he talk to Mia Motley? I don't think so. Can he talk to the prime minister of Grenada? I don't think so. His bad, nasty reputation is doing damage to the economy of Antigua and Barbuda. And we need to get him out of the way so that we can have friends in the region and outside of the region that are willing to do business with Antigua and Barbuda. Mr. Prime Minister, please, for the sake of Antigua and Barbuda, please go. I'm, I'm going to just ask Brother Shafi, keep the mic right there. Because we have heard in relation to the Paris Club, and we have heard the Prime Minister is now complaining that the Paris Club doesn't want to do any business, and uh, Dr. Daniel would have mentioned th th to some extent, with Antigua and Barbuda, and then he, sh he, sh he sought to blame it on the fact that of our high income, that's why. And then we start to realize it's because of their failure to meet their obligation why they do not want to do business with Antigua and Barbuda. And I want to address, for you to address your mind to the impact of reputation in terms of this, the credibility of a government and a, and a prime minister to effect meaningful development and attract foreign direct investment in Antigua and Barbuda. Can you address that for us, please? Yes. The problem with Gaston Brown is one of temperament. If you will recall, he cursed out the IMF people. Totally cursed them out. Cursed out the lady from Barbados. And then when the IMF now is assisting other countries, they're not dealing with Antigua, not under that prime minister. He cursed out the United Progressive Party for 
trying to resolve long-standing debts that the UPP tries to resolve to bring back into currency. When you have that reputation, you cannot go to borrowers because borrowers would have heard of your reputation. And that is the reason why we have had to borrow monies at commercial rates because you cannot go. None of the other self loan providers will provide for you. And so these things have a, a negative effect, an adverse effect upon our balance sheet and upon our budget and upon our economy. And so it is his temperament. He cursed everybody in Antigua who has a difference of opinion to him. And he, he, the words that he used, the vagabond language, that is the nature why he does not have reputation and credibility to present himself to these soft loan providers. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Brother Marshall in relation to that question because it appears that because of our habit of not paying or meeting our obligation, Brother Marshall, that these countries don't want to do business with Antigua and Barbuda. How has that affected our opportunity to get loans at very concessional rate? And because of the fact that we cannot do business with these, these countries, we now have to borrow at exorbitant interest rate. And I'm going to ask, when you're finished, Brother Marshall, because Sister Pearl would have been in the banking system for a very long time, so she can address her mind to some of those concerns as well. Yes, and I, and I agree with Brother Sherfield that as a result of the lack of any credibility by the current Antigua Labour Party and also from the past Antigua Labour Party, that it is really difficult, hard, and in most times impossible for the administration to see concessional financial support from any other country or even from business organization. We can recall that prior to 2004, as a result of the lack of credibility of the then ALP administration, they had to borrow at commercial rates, and they drove up the debt to GDP to 140%. And it is just now unfortunate that this current prime minister is trying to spread rumor about how it was the UPP that left this high debt to GDP. He's trying to exonerate the government in which he was the minister of planning from inefficiency, from lack of any policy, just simply an ad hoc way of dealing with economic development that then resounded in the failed state status of Antigua and Barbuda prior to 2004. And the United Progressive Party, because of the initiative, policy objective, and leadership of that organization, brought the debt to GDP to below 100% and placed Antigua and Barbuda once again in a position that they could borrow at less than commercial rate. And other financial institutions and governments were prepared to listen to the United Progressive Party so that they can reorganize some of the loans that the ALP had garnered for over 28 years when they were in office. And so it is very important for us as citizens and residents of Antigua and Barbuda to understand that when we have a government like this one that lacks policy direction, that is not concerned about the welfare of the people of Antigua and Barbuda, that is only concerned with the self-enrichment scheme that they've been advocating for some time, then only the people of this nation, only the people of Antigua and Barbuda will suffer. And so that is why 
we have to ask ourselves the question, is it because we are small? Is it because we lack resources, financial and natural resources? Why we find ourselves in this predicament, in this economic crisis that is facing Antigua and Barbuda? And if we are serious, we will come to the realization that is not because of our smallness. It is not because we lack resources. It is because of the policy of the Antigua Labour Party. And therefore, we, the people of this country, must exercise the franchise that is placed upon us to remove the Antigua Labour Party from office and to replace it with an organization that is concerned about people, that is people first, and has always developed policies and programs for the development of the people and for the development of Antigua and Barbuda. Yes, I agree that it's because of credibility issues, the track record, why they have to borrow at commercial rates. That last loan that they got from ACB where they said that uh, it was a consolidation, that loan where they, got, uh, they took $6 million out of it to purchase the Luke Cinema, that rate was 6.25%. At a time like this, when you have rates like 0 0.5 from international lending agencies, 6.25 is exorbitant. And you know what he did? No, he's the Minister of Finance. He would have negotiated that with the officer at the bank. You go into Parliament now and grandstanding about, oh, this, it, it, it's criminal. The rate is criminal. Making a big show. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to them about reducing that rate because it's criminal. You didn't know that was the rate that you negotiated? So these are the things that I'm talking about. You, you, and, and then the, the overdraft was 11%. In a time like this, come on. And it is because of the track record of this administration, of the government, why they have to risk. It's a, the rate that you get is based on your risk, the high risk of non-payment. So also, ECAB, look at what he did recently with ECAB and calling out the, the, the directors of the board. I'm warning ECAB people. I'm warning them. He trying to get, he's trying to get his hands on shares, ordinary shares. He don't want the preferential shares. He want the ordinary shares. He can dip his hand. He can bully. He can bully the local banks. That is what it's all about, you know. Bullying the local banks. And it is not fair. He, he has already exceeded the government's single borrowing ceiling at ACB. I'm sure he has tapped it out already at CUB. He wants to get his grubby hands now on ECAB so that they can tap out um, the, the single and, and go above the ceiling. If they know what's good for them, they better, they better not allow him to get ordinary shares because he is not the type of person that is, he has shown his track record has shown that he's not responsible. They don't care if they, at the end of the day, you can't take government to court. You can't sell the assets. Well, you can sell, I don't know if you can sell the assets. I haven't ever heard where they're selling government assets. But it, it's, uh, I am hoping that the people of this country will do the right thing when the elections are called so that we don't find ourselves and our institution, our local uh, financial institutions in a situation where they're, they're all crumbling because they have extended to the government and they're not being repaid. Thank you very much, Sister Pearl. We're gonna take another break. And when we come back, I'm gonna talk to Dr. Daniel a little bit and the rest of our panel about fuel prices. We'll be right back.
It's time to join the family at the People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. We offer savings accounts, deposits, fixed deposits, loans, among other related services. You can even become a shareholder by purchasing a minimum of 50 shares at $5 per share. Membership is super easy and convenient. Just visit our newly opened credit union building on Upper Newgate Street, Monday to Fridays, 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. with proof of ID and address, along with $15 to cover registration and passbook, and you'll be set and on your way. For further information, call 462-8888 or 727-2285. People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. Today, tomorrow, together. The United Progressive Party. The right choice. And welcome back. When we left, I did indicate to you that when we come back, we will be speaking a little bit about fuel prices. So I, I just want for Dr. Daniel to talk to us a little bit about the fuel price because the Prime Minister in his budget sought to compare Antigua fuel price with that of Barbados as opposed to um, price within our OECS region. Um, so, Dr. Daniel, speak a little bit about that, because after that we're going to talk a little bit about budgetary allocations. Now, I find it a little bit um, disingenuous of the Prime Minister to indicate as if the cushioning of fuel prices is something new, and it's just for his administration. The fact of the matter is, when fuel prices are low, Governments tend to get higher consumption taxes. When the price on the world market goes up, obviously to maintain stability in price, you cut the tax so that the price can be stable. That has been going on for forever. I was the energy officer, uh, what, four decades ago? Oh, no, sorry, three and a half decades ago, 1987. And that was one of the, the major tasks. Every month and every new shipment, if the price changes, in order to, if the import price changes in order to maintain stability of price, you had to change the tax. And in those days, any change in tax had to be gazetted. So practically every month I was gazetting a new consumption tax because the idea then is that you can't tax without legislation without the law. But I guess they don't bother with that now. The tax just keep changing and nobody bothers to legislate anything. That's taxation without legislation. <laughs> you just put up the tax and everybody goes merrily on their way. So the, that policy has been in place forever. And it's not a matter. But the the point is that when fuel prices were low, this Gaston Brown administration was receiving more than 50% consumption, more than 100%, sorry, consumption tax rate. More than 50% of the price paid at the pump was taxes. I see they're complaining that they're getting only $47 million in taxes that never existed prior to this administration. 
taxes were kept in about the 30, 30 million dollar range at the maximum. And when prices went up, those taxes fell. They're complaining they're getting 47 million. It came down from 79 million in taxes out of the pockets of the people of Antigua and Barbuda. And they're caring? Come on, give me a, what is it? A aspirin? So they have been pocketing monies out of the pockets of the poor man in Antigua and Barbuda. I have estimated that if when prices were low, they were willing to lower the prices, these bus and taxi men would have been making six to $10,000 a year if the prices were lowered. That's the amount of money that they've taken out of the pockets of the common transport operators by not lowering the prices and getting that excessive tax amount, consumption tax. So they're complaining that they're only receiving 47 million in consumption taxes out of the pockets of the transport sector rather than the 79 that they received in 2020. They have no sense of looking out for the common man. But they give concessions to billionaires and take the taxes out of the poor people. Well, let me leave it at that point. And, and could I just ask you to just answer this very quick follow-up question. Are we paying the lowest for fuel in the region, in the Caribbean? I have not looked at that recently because the prices fluctuate. And as I mentioned, perhaps in every shipment. And as we note recently, prices have been moving, um, have been fluctuating worldwide in recent times. But I'll have to look that up and come back to you. Not but I noticed that they didn't mention, they only mentioned Barbados. They never mentioned the, the OECS region. That, that's precisely why I asked you that particular question because we sell fuel to Dominica. And from the last numbers that I received, Dominique Dominic was selling at, fuel at for the lower than, than Antigua and Barbuda. So to make the comparison that we are the lowest in the region or in the Caribbean seems a little bit far-fetched to me. Right. Like I said, any statement that is made by this administration, we have to fact-check it. Is it true? <laughs> and, we but, will, and we will do that. Brother Boyd, let me just look into some of the allocations that were given to the respective ministries. and. And we, maybe we can probably do some analysis as to whether or not some of these allocations in, in the budget, um, if they would do the level of work. Because I, I heard you on, 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 on Saturday and you were indicating that it's not just about how much they receive. is They have to look into the numbers. See, what are they doing or what are their plans, what are the programs in, in terms of what are they going to spend on? Because if you look at the numbers, the government is saying 65% of every dollar is used towards wages and salaries. And if you spread that across the board, you know some ministries are going to be larger than others. And you look at 65% of budgetary allocation for ministry, right? Just looking at straight numbers to be spent on wages and salaries. That means for some ministries, you are left very little to do any meaningful program for the people of Antigua and Barbuda. So let us talk a little bit about budgetary allocations. OK, thank you. Now, based on allocation, this budget calls for expenditure of $1.6 billion. $1.6 billion is the amount, actually $1.7 billion. Now, out of that, $600 million, $610 million is used to pay back public debts. $610 million allocated to the repayment of public debts. In the Prime Minister's ministry, we have $35.6 million. Now, the Ministry of Importance here, you have agriculture, $17.5 million. Health, $114 million. Finance, $115 million. Education, $154 million. Ministry of Works, $87 million. Social transformation, $26 million. Now, 
you are correct. 66-65% is wages and salary. That gives an amalgamated amount of $410 million for wages and salary. So if you have $1.6 or $1.7 million to be spent, $1.7 billion, sorry, thank you, and $410 million is already salary then this is only salaries for, for the, the, the central government. You have salaries again for all the other non-established position and, and the other um, bodies. So you find most of the monies for the budget is spent on salaries and wages. So now what is there now to do the other services, provide the other services for the government? This is where you have to go into the nitty-gritty, into the details. Because when you find, when you look at the actual expenditure rather than the budgetary expend, expenditure, you're going to find that even though various programs are provided for and allocated by budget, the actual spending is for these corrupt deals. For instance, when you go to the Ministry of Works, you see one payment there for six point. 5.7 million. And when you really check it back, that 5.7 million is just that concrete plant. So for the entire year in that procurement of, 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 of capital things, just the only thing they bought is that concrete plant and paid all the money for it. So in that, when you go to the voucher, you see that $700,000 of it are said to be spent on shipping costs. And you know that 700000 was not spent on shipping costs. So this is how the money just fly away out of the consolidated funds and into the, the pockets of people. And nothing else is done. So then when we have roads to fix, when we have clinics to fix, we have police station to fix, no money is there, even though it's allocated. Because all the monies were used in a corrupt way. We know that the police stations, they, you know, they, they're in houses and Palm Police Station is not in Palm. The building has gone. The Poland's police station, uninhabitable. All the police stations are falling apart and no monies are spent to, to show them up and repair them and, and make the policemen comfortable. Instead, they go and buy a concrete plant because in that way, Half of it can become into somebody's pocket. And if you go through, and when we do get to go through the budget, because, you know, they have not yet released it, the only thing we have is the statement of the Prime Minister. When you get the budget and you start to analyze it, you look to the actual, and that's where you see where the corruption takes place. No matter what they allocate, is the actual. That's where the juice is. So, so, the, so the statement made by the Prime Minister in relate, the budget statement made by the Prime Minister on Thursday yes. really just give you whole figures saying, you know, I'm going to spend 150 something million on education. But until we get into the detail, get into the weeds and start to clear with some of the bush and you really see where they're actually spending the money, then is when we can say whether or not the programs that they're, they're implementing for education is their meaningful programs, yes or no, or if there's corruption, that is, that is taking a, quite a large percentage of, of that money. And I see Dr. Daniel wants to get in here. Yeah, of course. Yeah, one, of, one of the areas that I want to look at is um, I re recall that prior to the, what was 2018 election, in 2017, there was an allocation of almost $90 million as grants to individuals. $90 million in grants given by the administration. And you wonder who got those grants? $90 million. That's not peanut change. Who got that? These are the type of decisions that this administration has been making. The budgeted allocation may have been something like 400 and something thousand. And the actual turns out to be 90 million. These are the things that are happening under this administration. 
Doc, um, are you aware, and I'm going to go to Brother Marshall, are you aware if there was supplementary appropriation in relation to the excess spending? Because if you look, look at that, the budget that allocation the... for 400000 and then you move from 400000 to $90 million, somebody have a lot of explaining to do. Well, that has been the complaint of the auditor year after year. You read the audit report, you get the same thing. Every audit report, the failure of the government to bring these spending to Parliament. Go ahead, Brother, um, brother Bowen. Th this is the auditor's report for 2017. And right here at page 85, it says, Supplemental provisions. An amount of $291,264,863 was said to be supplemental provision. This figure, this is the auditor, this figure, however, could not be verified since all the requests made to obtain the relevant information in respect to supplemental provisions were proved fruitless. We were therefore unable to verify the amounts and to ascertain the value of any special. What, what, what amount was that again? 291 million. $264,863. And, and, and you're saying that that was spent without any authorization? No, no authorization. And let, let, me, let, me, let me go to Brother Marshall because I, I, I see he wants to get in. Brother Marshall? Yes, I just want to say that we have to look at government programs and the allocation to the various ministries. And if those allocations are sufficient in order to realize the objectives that they're talking about. We said COVID presents a glorious opportunity for them to transform the economy because the old way of doing things is not working. And one would assume that if we're talking about self-sufficiency and self-food -sec security, that there would be more funds allocated to the Ministry of Agriculture than on previous occasion. But this government seemed to have a policy of adding a 5% here or subtracting a 5% here when they're doing the budget. So the allocation basically remains the same in terms of priority. So I would assume that if the government is serious, special emphasis would be placed on agriculture and tourism. And I agree that education and health has to be there because as I said previously, the pandemic, is a health issue with serious economic implication. But how are we going to feed ourselves out of this crisis? When we are giving to agriculture $25.6 million, dear, as opposed to increase the allocation for agriculture so we can develop farming, so we can develop agro-processing, so that we can stop the flow of foreign exchange, scarce foreign exchange, leaving Antigua and Barbuda to import foods that we can produce in Antigua and Barbuda somewhere in that budget presentation. The Prime Minister said we're spending thousands of dollars to import food, some of which we can grow in Antigua and Barbuda. And if you want to stop that leakage, it therefore means we must give agriculture a substantive proportion of the expenditure so they can transform agriculture. The same thing happened in tourism. Tourism got 25 point something million dollars. Tourism is supposed to be the engine of growth in Antigua and Barbuda. And its allocation is almost similar to that of social transformation. So is the government serious? The answer, therefore, is no. The government is not serious about developing the economy of Antigua and Barbuda in making Antigua and Barbuda self-sufficient and therefore create opportunities for health, education, housing, nutrition, and meaningful employment to the people. Thank you very much, um, Brother Marshall. And, and I, I just wanted just to address a point that you raised there. Under the United Progressive Party, you're, you're looking at budgets, and I think under Dr. Court, as a finance minister, you're, you're talking about a budget of about seven, $750, $790 million. 
under Harold Lovell, you're talking about budget of about a little over $600 million. This administration is spending $1.6 billion. And, and let, me, let me just ask what the chef I am mean, asked Brother Shuffley because he raised this point on, on, on Saturday. In 2020, the budgetary allocation was $850 million. The deficit was $744 million. You're talking about a total expenditure of over $1.6 billion in 2020. Yet still, we can't, we, we can't see any stimulus. We can't find any relief for our, our, our local, our seniors. And when you look back into the budget this year, then you hear the Prime Minister waxing eloquently and listing all the social programs that was brought into being by the United Progressive Party and touting these as these social programs and seeking to take credit from them. I am very concerned because I know, Brother Boeing, that this government has a propensity to overspend by plenty. So if your budget is 1.6 billion, you, you can expect <laughs> about a five or 600 million in actual numbers in terms of deficit. And they yet still, they're still seeking to borrow close to a billion dollars. But what do we have to show for it? And, and before you answer Brother Boeing, I'm gonna ask Sister Pearl this question because I wanted to address the kitchen, kitchen table issue. What has your constituency seen having spent $1.6 billion in 2020. I want to keep it short. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And they were looking for, they were looking for reduced food prices. They were looking to see whether they would be able to pay their mortgage, something. They're looking towards the budget for some sort of relief in terms of um, whether they would be able to send their children to private school or public school, whether they be able to buy, have internet access, provide internet access for their children. They were looking to, uh, people were, who were owed by the government were hoping that they would get monies um, that were owed to them, substantial amounts. We just have to look at the number of pickets we have been having lately. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. And all of them are about outstanding monies owed. So people are, are, are out there. They're feeling the, the pinch. They're not seeing the government coming forward for them. All this money being thrown out there. And nothing for the people who are owed. I just don't understand it. And they don't understand it either. How is it that the government is spending so much money? They have so much money to be buying this, to be buying that, to be saying that they're going to buy um, Kalaluke and they're going to buy Jolly Beach. But they don't have any money to pay the people what they're owed. I mean, it is so unfair to the people. So this budget has not touched the people, um, the bread and butter issues for the people. They uh, feel left out in the cold again. And I think this administration needs to get out of the way and let the UPP administration take over to bring relief to the people. Brother Boyan, $1.6 billion. Not this budget, I'm talking about 2020. Right. $1.6 billion. Correct. What value did we receive as Antiguans and Barbudans? Well, let me adjust the point of the deficit. 2020, they said that they expected 961 million in revenue. Also, they said that they expected to receive grants, grants of 82 million. Well, when the actual figures came out, the actual grants, zero dollars, zero. So that 82 million was just plugged in there because they couldn't find where they're gonna find that 82 million dollars. So they just plug it in, even though they know that they don't have no way of expecting, truly expecting to receive that grant. So the actual revenue for 2020 was $749 million. Again, they had projected $961 million. However, even though that the 
only received 749 million in 2020. In 2021, they're still projecting that they're going to receive a million dollars. We don't have yet the actual receipts for 2021. We're waiting for that. But in 2022, they're now projecting they're going to receive 1.1 million, 1 billion and 32 million dollars. And in that figure, there's grants again for 37 million. Who is giving them grants? We don't know. So when you set up to spend 1.7 billion dollars, knowing that the year before you only collect 749 million, it is reckless. It is reckless. You are just tax uh, putting debt on the people's head, and this deficit here in the 2022 budget, the actual deficit is 600 million dollars. Now we know that if you have a household and you're spending more money than your income, than you're earning, you know where you're going, straight to bankruptcy. And so where do they plan to take us, knowing that they receive $749 million in revenue and still intend to spend $1.6 billion? Where are they trying to take us? Right into bankruptcy as a failed state. Very interesting. Dr. Daniel? Perhaps I'll ask the, the banker, if somebody came to you for a loan with that profile, would they qualify? <laughs> so I don't know who's, who's going to be the lender, but um, that particular profile does not look good. But again, this administration tends to dazzle with BS. And that's what we are seeing in the budget. So let me just give this opportunity to, and I'll start with Brother Marshall, to just to do a little rap. And then we have had a, I would consider to be a very fruitful conversation this evening. And I, I'm hoping that all Antiguans are listening and getting an opportunity to really understand the budget as it is being presented and there's lots more information to come but it is very important for all of us to understand that the budget should reflect the honesty in an administration the honesty in government it should not seek to deceive us it should not seek to mamagai or bamboozle it should represent honesty because every day businesses are going to make decisions based on the budget based on what government intends to do. And when that intention is misleading or wrong or misguided or just deliberate, then these businesses are planning on the assumption, on the assumption that government have their back and then the next thing you know, the rug is pulled from under them. So I'm going to give Brother Marshall an opportunity. If you have any closing statement, if you want to address any of the issues or any issue that he feels is necessary to address, and also do his wrap-up at the same time. Okay, so I will do my wrap-up. There's a statement that the responsibility of a citizen is to ask questions, and if they don't understand the answer given, then they know what they must do, change the government. And so even if the citizens of Antigua and Barbuda don't understand the foolishness that the Prime Minister puts out for a budget, then their lived expectation, their lives, they live in the society. They know what are the challenges of the society. They know what are the difficulties and the hardship that they're going through. And no citizen in no society should be going through these challenges that we are going through in Antigua and Barbuda. And how are we going to end that situation? To go out get registered, and when the time comes to vote for all the candidates of the United Progressive Party in Antigua and to vote for Brother Trevor Walker in Barbuda so that we can return a semblance of decency, honesty, transparency, and brotherhood to Antigua and Barbuda so for once again we can restore pride we can deliver hope and we can have a society for the people, of the people, and by the people.
Thank you very much. Sister Pearl, any issue you may want to address in your wrap up? No, I'll just I'll just wrap up. The bottom line is the people don't care about the growth rate. They don't care about GDP to debt ratio. They don't care about whether or not we, you know, the billions of dollars they're throwing out there. They care about the things that touch their lives and their livelihoods. That's what they care about. So don't come and tell me nothing. You can't horns woggle the people anymore. They have heard enough. How many times can you tell a person, look, these jobs are coming. These projects are coming. How many times? And they believe you. A promise is a comfort to a fool. So they have had enough of the promises. And I believe that this time around, the people want to see action. And they are going to get action with a United Progressive Party administration. They will do the right thing. They will make the right choice when the time comes. The United Progressive Party, the right choice. Dr. Daniel? Let me end where I began, that too often we do not get the truth out of this administration. As we go through the, the budget, and unfortunately, the estimates have not been made public. They're not available on the government site. Um, and I'm even told, even the senators who are supposed to debate these estimates have not received them as yet. I'm not too sure why they're hiding the numbers. But from what we have seen, I look and I believe something is wrong with the administration in terms of their ability to manage. If St. Kitts, who do not have close to the growth that we tout, can afford to give stimulus and double salaries with lesser growth than Antigua and Barbuda. Why is it not possible here? We're at the end of the year, rather than getting double salaries, a lot of em government employees are not being paid. And the pensioners have to wait till the next year to get pensions. Is it a management problem that we face? That this administration are poor managers of the resources of the country? Because it can't be money. They claim we have the highest growth. As a matter of fact, when you look at the introduction to the, the first few statements in the budget statement, it begins, our nation's economy is bouncing back. The economy is growing at a rapid pace. Tourism is recovering and employment is increasing. The people of our country have not been burdened with new and huge debt. Instead, we have kept borrowing down to an absolute minimum. However, in order to further stimulate the economy, we have to increase borrowings in 2022. If you're managing the economy, if you're growing, if you're generating revenues, then you shouldn't have to borrow a third of your budget. Something is wrong with that picture. So, I hope that the people of Antigua and Barbuda can recognize exactly what is happening to our country. That this administration has made enemies left, right, and center. No reputable person is willing to do business with the Gaston Brown administration. In the first few years of his administration, he was flying all over the world. And what has he brought back to us to show for all the trips that has benefited the people of Antigua and Barbuda? For all of the billion dollars in CIP investment, when you look around Antigua, what have you seen for the billion dollars in CIP money? Nothing. So I hope that looking at the picture as to where Antigua and Barbuda is now, the people will recognize where the problem lies. And the problem lies at the head of the administration and with the Antigua Labor Party. 
They need to move aside so that a breath of fresh air can flow through Antigua and Barbuda. That people will once again respect us. We can have commonality with the leaders around the country, the leaders in business around the world, so that Antigua and Barbuda can have real economic growth that will benefit the poorest of the poor and all the people of Antigua and Barbuda. Brother Boyne? Yes. Now, at one point in my life, I was a banker, and I had work in the loans department. Now, when a company comes to borrow money, you want to see what projection they make, which is the budget, but what you really rely on is the audited statement, the one that is actually done and, and verified by the auditor. So if I was to really analyze these budget, which are just projections, I would analyze it by checking the actuals. Now let me read to you what the auditors say in the last audit report I have. I have already indicated that the supplementary, they said they could find no evidence that these were approved. Statement of expenditure, here's the opinion of the auditor. They cannot verify that these statements are correct. Let's go to surplus for deficit for the year on the review. The auditor, we are reasonably sure that the, remote, the reported amount of $126,298.12 does not present the true financial picture for the accounts. Now, as a banker, you look at that, I'm not lending you no, no money. Let's continue. Statement of actual and estimated revenue. See what the opinion is. The financial statement for the year 2017 does not represent a true picture. Another section. The statement of deposit, the auditor. We can therefore conclude that for the government of Antigua and Barbuda, the statement of deposit does not represent a true picture. On and on in this report, I cannot express an opinion does not represent a true picture. In fact, it says here on this one, based on the information we examine, we can conclude that the statement of contingent liabilities is not fairly presented. Continue. Statement of investment. This continues to be in breach of the law. All of them. Therefore, the above statement, the presentation of the public accounts incomplete. On and on, everyone here is a qualified statement that these are hocus pocus, not properly presented. This is a con man's job and no one can rely on it. <laughs> Let me take this time to say thank you to all of you for tuning in to this panel conversation. I want to say to stay focused. Our country needs you. This country needs for every citizen to wake up, open up their eyes, and do the right thing. If you are not registered, get registered. Visit the Vote UPP page and ensure that you log on to your candidate profile. You get a sense as to where you need to be registered. You get the necessary document and you get yourself registered. This election is too important for you to sit it out. Your country needs you. You need to act. This election is about you and your future. I want to thank you again for locking in, getting the information that is required. There are more programs like this and other forums where we will continue 
to provide the level of education to make sure that you can make the right choice. And you have heard from our panelists. You have seen the debate or heard the debate. Now it's time for you to recognize, as citizens of Antigua and Barbuda, you have a duty to get up and participate in this process. And if I may be as bold, if I may be as bold to say to you, make the right choice. And the right choice is the United Progressive Party. On Wednesday, we will be having right here another panel discussion. So please make sure that you tune in and stay close to the My UPP Facebook page. More information will be given and also on Progressive 107.3. I want to thank all my panelists, Brother Cartwright Marshall, Sister Pearl Quinn Williams, Brother Sherfield Bowen, and Dr. George Daniel for being a part of this very important conversation about the budget 2022. Have a good night. Godspeed. God's blessing. Thank you. The United Progressive Party. The right choice. It's time to join the family at the People's Cooperative Credit Union Limited. We offer savings accounts, deposits, fixed deposits, loans, among other related services. You can even become a shareholder by purchasing a minimum of 50 shares at $5 per share. Membership is super easy and convenient. Just visit our newly opened credit union building on Upper Newgate Street, Monday to Fridays, 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. with proof of ID and address, along with $15 to cover registration and passbook, and you'll be set and on your way. For further information, call 462-8888 or 727-2285. People's Cooperative Credit Union. <laughs>